In today's episode of Plants of the Gods, we want to talk about Albert Hoffman, Richard Schultes, and Gordon Wasson, the so-called holy trinity of ethnomycology, and why two women must be added to the pantheon. Fungi have already given us the most important class of drugs ever discovered, antibiotics. More recently, the fungal kingdom provided us with another blockbuster class of pharmaceuticals, statins, cholesterol-lowering drugs that rank among the most important and widely used medicines in the industrialized world today. The most significant major medical development in the past few years involving fungi is the mainstreaming of hallucinogens into Western medicine. They represent the ultimate tools of the indigenous shaman, who employs these plants and fungi like biological scalpels to investigate, diagnose, treat, and sometimes cure ailments that have a partial emotional or spiritual basis. This is why these healers can often alleviate a medical problem unresponsive to therapies employed by Western physicians. The use of these chemicals is rapidly gaining acceptance in traditional clinical settings. Many initial efforts have focused on the use of hallucinogens administered by these shamans, mescaline, ayahuasca, and psilocybin. In fact, psilocybin from magic mushrooms is offering so much potential that mycologist Paul Stamets has dubbed it, quote, the Einstein molecule. These mind-altering remedies have been clinically shown to produce promising therapeutic effects in some cases of addiction, depression, obsessive-compulsive disorder, and end-of-life anxiety in terminal cancer patients. Further formal studies are likely to take place for the treatment of anorexia, early stages of Alzheimer's, insomnia, intractable pain, and even PTSD. This newfound interest in hallucinogenic therapies is not only improving our understanding of the human mind, but also driving an enhanced appreciation of shamanic healing practices. So let's talk about the Summer of Love, 1967 in San Francisco, in which 100,000 people or more descended on Haight-Ashbury and Golden Gate Park. John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas wrote a very famous song commemorating this event, If You're Going to San Francisco, Put Flowers in Your Hair, which was a big hit for Scott McKenzie. Even George Harrison showed up in Golden Gate Park to figure out what the fuss was all about. But there's a part of the story that's seldom told and appreciated, because just three blocks south of Golden Gate Park, in what was known as the Toland Auditorium at the UCSF Medical School in January from 28 to 30 of 1967 was one of the most important meetings ever held of the psychedelic renaissance. There were 32 speakers. The name of the conference was the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. It was organized by people like Gordon Wasson and Richard Schultes to bring together the current thinkers who believe that hallucinogens offer great potential for Western medicine. This is a part of the summer of love and hallucinogens, which is seldom told, but I believe will have much greater and further impact on human well-being. As mentioned, one of the featured speakers at the conference was Gordon Wasson, a most intriguing and fascinating character. I had the honor and privilege of meeting Wasson on many occasions when I was working at the Botanical Museum in the 70s and 80s. Wasson was born in Great Falls, Montana. He grew up in Newark. An overlooked aspect of his upbringing, which helped create the man and the leader and the thinker that he came to be, was his father. His father was an iconoclastic Episcopal priest with a very sardonic sense of humor. Two researchers who brought these aspects of Wasson's personalities to light were Robert Fort and Tom Riedlinger, and I'll put the references in the show notes. Let me quote what Robert Fort and Tom Riedlinger had to say about Wasson and his father. The father was a somewhat controversial Episcopal priest who wrote a book in 1914 called Religion and Drink, 
which used biblical references to refute prohibitionists. According to Wasson, his father, quote, never tired of pointing out that Christ's first miracle was the conversion of water into wine, not wine into grape juice, and that the last act of Jesus's ministry was to invite his apostles to drink wine in remembrance of him. Wasson also told a story of the time his father helped him with the grammar school assignment. There came a year when my teacher in school asked us to memorize each week a verse of our own selection from the Bible and then recite it in class. Our father felt contempt for this homeopathic approach to the vast subject of Bible study, and he conspired with me to find the most absurd, the most embarrassing verses for me to take to class. Imagine my glee. It was known, of course, that my father was a clergyman, and the confusion of my teacher was all the more extreme. After she'd called on me two weeks running, she therefore ignored my presence. At home, Wasson's father took pains to teach him and his brother a deep appreciation for the Bible. Together, they carefully read it from cover to cover three times, with Edmund, the father, expounding the text. Quote, According to the latest interpretation of scholars and critics, the higher criticism, as this body of Bible exegesis was called, how extraordinary must have been the spectacle of us little boys in short trousers prattling about the Vulgate, the Septuagint, the Pentateuch, and the Hexateuch, the use of Yahweh and Elohim and of Adonai, interpolations of priestly redactors, the reconstructed sayings of Jesus, and all the other terms then current in Bible study— Moreover, we each learned a verse of the Bible by heart every day, and it was our practice to repeat the nine verses learned on the nine previous days as well. Two important takeaways from this. One was that Wasson had a deep reverence for religion, and the other, as he said, he didn't have much time for the humbug, which was also part of uh, what he regarded as fundamentalist religion. After graduating from college at Columbia University, Wasson visited London, where he met and married a white Russian emigre named Valentina Pavlovna Gherkin, who was studying to be a physician. Returning to New York City and Columbia University, he was teaching English for a year. He had a formative influence on one student, the great poet Langston Hughes, who went on to become a leader of the Harlem Renaissance and who remembered Wasson vividly many decades later. Quote, As for the instructors at Columbia who I knew, the only one who interested me much was Mr. Wasson, who read H.L. Mencken aloud all the time. End of quote. And of course, H.L. Mencken was another famous iconoclast. Wasson then became a financial journalist for the next seven years. After writing about business, he learned enough to land a job as a banker in New York in 1928. Six years later, he joined the staff of another bank, J.P. Morgan and Company. In one of the seemingly shamanic coincidences in this story, J.P. Morgan Jr. had studied mycology, that is fungi, at Harvard as an undergraduate, among other subjects. He later donated monies to Harvard to help build the famous Farlow Herbarium, one of the world's most important collections of fungi, with close to 1.5 million specimens, including the original magic mushrooms, which would later be collected both by Richard Schultes and Gordon Wasson. In an oft-told tale, Gordon and Valentina, who's better known as Tina Wasson, were on their honeymoon in the Catskills, about 100 miles north of Manhattan, when they chanced upon some mushrooms. Having grown up collecting and consuming edible mushrooms as a child in Russia, Tina expressed her glee, while Gordon expressed horror and disgust at these so-called toxic toadstools. Tina brought them back to their cabin, where she cooked and ate them. Gordon refused to touch them. When Tina woke up the next morning healthy and happy, Gordon changed his attitude, and they began researching and writing about the role of mushrooms in history. At this point, we turn to my mentor, Richard Schultes. Schultes is covered in great detail in two episodes of season one of Plants of the Gods. He's widely regarded as the father of ethnobotany and began his academic work as an undergraduate at Harvard studying peyote. His studies were so excellent that his mentor, Oakes Ames, sent him to Oklahoma to study 
Peary as used by the Kiowa peoples. Schultes traveled to Oklahoma with a grad student named Weston Labar, who later became famous as an expert in indigenous religions. And after a night in the teepee taking peyote with the Kiowa roadmen, that is the shamans, Schulte said he was lost to medicine forever. But as we'll see later in this episode, that was not true. In the early 1900s, an American ethnobotanist who worked for the USDA named William Safford had published several important papers on the identification of New World hallucinogens. He then turned his attention to try and figure out the riddle of Tio Nanacatl, the flesh of the gods, from the chronicles that had been recorded by the Spaniards right after the conquest. Safford could never find a mushroom that was hallucinogenic and ended up in a publication in Heredity magazine saying there were no hallucinogenic mushrooms, despite what had been claimed in the Spanish chronicles. Safford believed that this was just the indigenous peoples trying to mislead the Spaniards so they could continue to consume their hallucinogenic sacrament, which was the peyote cactus. Schultes, as a Harvard undergraduate working on this peyote issue, then went to the herbarium in the Smithsonian to investigate the specimens of peyote cactus in the collection. While studying peyote specimens in the Smithsonian Institution Herbarium, Schultes discovered a letter from an Austrian national living in Mexico by the name of Blas Pablo Reco. Reco wrote that Safford was mistaken and that Tio Nanacatl was indeed a magic mushroom still celebrated and consumed by the Mazatec peoples in the state of Oaxaca. In 1938, Schultes headed to Mexico to investigate. Here's what Reco wrote. I see that Dr. Safford believes that this plant to be the Tio Nanacatl of Sahagún, which is surely wrong. That is, it's not the peyote cactus. It is actually, as Sahagún states, a fungus which grows on dung heaps and which is still used under the same name by the Indians of the Sierra Juarez and Oaxaca in their religious feasts, in which they also use the Olo Liuki, which is doubtless Ipomia sidrifolia. So it's important that Reco not only found that the indigenous peoples in southern Mexico were not consuming a cactus, which grows in the deserts to the north, but that they were also taking a plant called Ololiuki, which turned out to be a hallucinogenic morning glory. This is very important because at the time, scientists didn't know there were any hallucinogenic morning glories. And as we'll see later, Wasson, when he visited, found they were also using a hallucinogenic mint. And at the time, nobody believed there were any hallucinogens in the mint family. This is why ethnobotany is so endlessly interesting. To purchase Dr. Mark Plotkin's new book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, or his first book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, visit your local bookseller or order from Amazon.com. Schultes met Reco in Mexico City, and they headed south to Oaxaca, a combination of train rides and muleback into the most remote aspects of the mountains. In the middle of the journey, Reco turned to Schultes and said, you know, Roosevelt is a Jew. And Schultes started to realize, based on this and other comments, that Reco was an absolutely fervent Nazi. Schultes couldn't help but correct him. He said, no, actually, Roosevelt is an old Dutch name, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt is not Jewish. At which point, Rico looked at him and said, Roosevelt is a Jew, and probably you are too. Schultes looked at Rico and said, let's stick to the mushrooms. Schultes and Rico were able to collect the magic mushrooms, and Schultes published two important papers on the topic, one in the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets, which was printed on a hand-operated press in the museum basement, and the other in a prestigious journal, The American Anthropologist. He then decided that his future lay in the Amazon and headed south. He planned to be in the Amazon for about a year, but ended up staying for 14. There he collected tens of thousands of medicinal plants, including the first well-documented collection of ayahuasca. 
This is all covered in great detail in the Schulte Storybook Map on the ACT website and AmazonTeam.org, as well as two episodes in the first season of Plants of the Gods. I want to give a brief outline here, a brief timeline, because actually the story of the discovery by the outside world of Tionanacatl, the magic mushrooms, is a little bit complicated. It's been told many times, but very seldom correctly. So in 1916, William Safford published his paper claiming that Tionanacatl was actually the peyote cactus, which was incorrect. In 1919, Rick published something contradicting him in a small uh, outlet in Mexico. In 1923, Rico writes the Smithsonian saying that he had cracked the riddle of Tionanacatl. In 1936, a linguist named Robert Whiteliner traveled to Oaxaca and was actually able to collect samples of the mushrooms aided by a merchant named Durantes, uh, the same family that helped me when I was in Oaxaca about 20 years ago. But the samples he collected were poorly collected and even more poorly preserved, so they were of no scientific use uh, for identification purposes. In 1938, Schultes traveled to Oaxaca uh, and collected the mushrooms and sent them back to Harvard. Ironically, it's the same year that Albert Hoffman uh, invented LSD in the lab. That same year, Gene Bassett Johnson, an uh, anthropologist, was able to actually view the ceremony in Oaxaca. And then in 1953, Wasson uh, and his wife traveled to Oaxaca with white liner to observe the ceremony themselves. Now, here's a really intriguing backstory about this. Wasson and his wife became interested in the death of the Emperor Claudius. This is the ultimate cold case. This is a murder that happened 2,000 years earlier. And according to the early Roman historians like Tacitus and Suetonius, Claudius had been poisoned by his wife who used poison mushrooms. They wanted to figure out, was this true and which mushrooms she would have used? So in thinking about who would know the most about this, The reigning expert on the Emperor Claudius was Robert Graves. Now, Graves was a a fascinating character, a British classical scholar and poet who had written a fabulous book called I, Claudius. It's a fictional autobiography. It was then made into a BBC series. I, I highly recommend both. They're terrific. So it was Valentina, it was Tina Wasson who had the idea of reaching out to Graves, which she did. Graves wrote back, gave them the information, which was later published as a paper in the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets called Mushrooms for Murderers, The Death of the Emperor Claudius, and I'll put the reference in the show notes. The Wassons and Graves stuck up a lively correspondence, and at one point in the early 50s, Graves wrote them and said, oh, and by the way, did you know that there are mushroom cults in southern Mexico? This fellow, Schultes, uh, actually documented their use of hallucinogenic mushrooms. This was in a very obscure pharmaceutical in-house publication. Many people think it was Graves sent them Schultes' papers, not the case. When the Wassons received this information, they were able to track down Schulte's two papers, the one in the Botanical Museum leaflets and the one in the American Anthropologist. And that's what turbocharged the efforts to bring this to the outside world. Now, consider this in in, in perspective. Schulte's had done seminal work on peyote and then seminal work on the mushrooms. So by the age of 25, 26, he had, in a sense, brought mescaline from peyote and psilocybin from the mushrooms to the outside world. However, the chemistry of these mushrooms had not been done. Nobody knew what psilocybin was. Nobody knew what the active principle was. And it would take Wasson's ability to bring together these uh, interdisciplinary teams. Wasson brought in Roger Heim, the leading mushroom taxonomist, that is the person who classifies mushrooms. And he also brought in Albert Hoffman, who, as I said, had synthesized Uh, LSD a few years later. And Hoffman traveled to Oaxaca with the Wassons in 1962 to see 
the mushroom cults and the mushroom ceremony in situ. I want to make a point here about the role of women in science and in ethnobotany. It's really been the custom of medical history to overlook the role of women. Let me give you an example. William Withering, the physician who discovered digitalis in the late 1700s, learned of the plant from a female herbalist. The story goes it was Mother Hutton, but uh, there's reasons to believe that was just a made-up figure. But in other words, the, the, the woman who brought this to the outside world via Ritherings, his name was lost. Edward Jenner, the father of vaccinations, much in the news these days, learned about vaccinations because milkmaids who got cowpox didn't get smallpox. So Jenner essentially got the idea from women that vaccinations were not only feasible, but beneficial. Even if you look at the story of Alexander Fleming in the middle of the 20th century, the early 20th century, who discovered antibiotics, namely penicillin, when he announced his discovery, there were female herbalists who came forward saying, that's not a discovery. We, we keep moldy bread on the windowsill to treat infections, particularly after childbirth. So once again, we see the same story in that Tina Wasson's role being overlooked here. Tina Wasson was a physician. Gordon was a businessman. And as an ethnobotanist who's not a physician, I frequently have to consult medical uh, colleagues to get their side of, of the story and, and the science that frames this. So I think that we need to add Tina Wasson to the pantheon of ethnomycology. Her role has been greatly overlooked. And I will say this, when Gordon published papers like uh, The Death of Claudius, Mushroom for Murders, it was under his name. But towards the end of his life, when Gordon donated his collection of mushroom stones and books and things like that to the Harvard Botanical Museum, he insisted it be called the Tina and Gordon Wasson Ethnomycological Library. It was only on Wasson's third expedition to Oaxaca, in total he made 10 visits to the uh, south of Mexico, that he was able to actually participate in a velada, which is a mushroom ceremony. He was accompanied by a photographer named Alan Richardson. Later, Wasson published an article with illustrations by Richardson in Life magazine, which immediately made him the most famous ethnomycologist in the world. An overlooked part of the story is that Tina Wasson published a piece shortly thereafter. In this piece, she was one of the first, if not the first, to suggest that these magic mushrooms could be useful psychotherapeutic agents. Remember, she was a physician. Wasson was not. She was a physician. Schultes was not. She was a physician. Uh, Hoffman was not. She thought that if the active principle could be isolated, and we now know that's psilocybin, which nobody knew at the time, that it could be a very important tool in Western medicine. She suggested it could be useful in the treatment of alcoholism. She was right. Other addiction, she was right. Mental disorders and severe pain. In each of these cases, she was right. Several years later, she also was the first to suggest that uh, these hallucinogenic substances could be important tools in helping people with end-of-life anxiety. In other words, people with terminal cancer uh, or suffer terribly. And Tina was, again, proven right that this indeed aids the suffering of these terminal patients. This is covered in great detail in the film Fantastic Fungi that I talked about last time. Clearly, she was ahead of her time. Clearly, that her training and practice as a physician provided an additional insight, a complementary insight to those of the more famous men who were always cited as the founding members of ethnomycology, indeed the holy trinity of ethnomycology. Now, Albert Hoffman became interested in these stories of hallucinogenic mushrooms in the mid-50s when he was already a well-known and highly regarded chemist uh, based in part on his discovery of LSD. In fact, it was the fact that he had uh, discovered, created, synthesized LSD that led to the mushrooms ending up in his laboratory. And this account comes from a book called Mushroom Pioneers by my colleague John Allen, and I'll put the reference in the show notes. 
Now, in 1958, not yet having been to Mexico, he nonetheless was working on specimens that were supplied to him from Roger Heim. Roger was the uh, classification specialist from Paris that had been to Oaxaca with Gordon Wasson. Hoffman cracked the code by isolating and synthesizing the two alkaloids from psilocybe based on mushrooms that have been grown in the lab. Now, Wasson, who is very much an old-school scientist, decided to test the effects of the mushrooms by taking them himself. In one of the most famous quotes in the whole field of ethnobiology, ethnobotany, ethnomycology, Hoffman wrote, quote, 30 minutes after taking the mushrooms, the exterior world began to undergo a strange transformation. Everything assumed a Mexican character, as I was perfectly well aware that my knowledge of the Mexican origin of the mushrooms would lead me to imagine only Mexican scenery, I tried to deliberately look on my environment, this was in his lab in Switzerland, as I knew it normally. But all voluntary efforts to look at things in their customary forms and colors proved ineffective. Whether my eyes were wide open or closed, I saw only Mexican motifs and colors. When the doctor supervising the experiment bent over to check my blood pressure, he was transformed into an Aztec priest, and I would not have been astonished if he had drawn an obsidian knife. A little later in the experience, he wrote, quote, At the peak of the intoxication, about one and a half hours after ingestion of the mushrooms, the rush of interior pictures, mostly abstract motifs rapidly changing in shape and color, reached such an alarming degree that I feared that I would be torn into this whirlpool of form and color and would dissolve. Again, this speaks to the importance of having a guide, which I can't emphasize enough. These are plants of the gods, but they've also been described as plants of the devil. And that is why no one, nowhere, should take these fungi, these chemicals, on their own by themselves without an experienced guide or shaming guiding the way. A couple of years later, Hoffman and his wife were able to accompany Wasson back to Oaxaca to see and explore these ceremonies on their own. One of the results of their collaboration was the discovery of Sca Maria Pastora, the world's first hallucinogenic mint. So complicated, so unique was the chemistry of this plant that even the great Hoffman, one of the greatest natural product chemists who ever lived, was not able to isolate the compound, which was completely different than the alkaloids, which are responsible for the hallucinogenic effects of most mushrooms and higher plants. The final person I'd like to propose we add to the pantheon of ethnomycology may be the most important of all, and that is Maria Sabina Magdalena Garcia, better known as Maria Sabina, a Mazatec indigenous person from Huautla, the capital of Mazatec country in the state of Oaxaca in southern Mexico. It was Maria Sabina who taught Gordon Wasson and his team the value of the magic mushrooms, and indeed conducted the ceremonies that Wasson recorded and shared with the world. Maria Sabina was preliterate. There's questions whether she even spoke Spanish, but she was a poet. Let me read the text from one of the ceremonies recorded by Wasson. Quote, The secrets the mushrooms revealed to me are enclosed in a big book, that they, the mushroom, showed to me. At one point, a duende, like a gnome or an elf, came toward me. He asked a strange question. But what do you wish to become, you, Maria Sabina? I answered him without thinking that I wished to become a saint. Then the spirit smiled and immediately had in his hands something that was not there before, a big book with many written pages. Here, he said, I'm giving you this book so that you can work better and help people who need help and know the secrets of the world where everything is known. I thumbed through the leaves of the book, many and many written pages, and alas, I thought I didn't know how to read. And suddenly I was reading and understanding all that was written. It was as though I had become richer, wiser. In a moment I had learned millions of things. I learned and learned and learned. 
One more timeless Maria Sabina quote to Gordon Wasson. Quote, The more you go inside the world of Tionanacatl, the more things are seen. You also see your past and your future, which are there together as a single thing, already achieved, already happened. I saw stolen horses and buried cities, the existence of which was unknown and was going to be brought to light. Millions of things I saw and knew, and I saw God, an immense clock that ticks, the hands going slowly around. Inside, the stars, the earth, the universe, the day and the night, the cry and the smile, the happiness and the pain. He who makes it to the end can even see that infinite clockwork. End of quote. Watson's work with Maria Sabina resulted in the documentation of her wonderful poetry, insight, and healing. He wrote Maria Sabina and her Magitech Mushroom Velada with other collaborators, which included recordings and the musical score of her ceremonies with lyrics translated from Mazatec to Spanish and to English. A fellow named Henry Munn later translated all of these songs to English in a book published by Alvaro Estrada. But the story doesn't end there. These five figures ended up in a collaboration which benefited the world, some in some unforeseen ways. We've talked about the value of psilocybin as a mind-opening and expanding therapeutic agent, which is showing hope for the curing of diseases which had long been considered by Western physicians to be incurable. But there's an odd coda to this story. A number of decades ago, Schulte's wife, Dorothy, uh, was having dinner with Albert Hoffman and his wife, and Schulte's opened a pill bottle and knocked some pills into her hand. Albert Hoffman happened to see the label. He said, oh, Viscan, a beta blocker. He said, you know, Dorothy, I'm the one who synthesized beta blockers, and I did it in part inspired by compounds that I extracted from the magic mushrooms given to Gordon Wasson by Maria Sabina, brought to the world by your husband, Richard Schultes. This is now a multi-billion dollar industry. Beta blockers are mainstays of Western medicine. Beta blockers reduce the workload on the heart and help it to beat more regularly. It's used to treat high blood pressure and to prevent chest pain. Here's what Hoffman wrote in one of the last pieces he published, and I'll put this in the show notes. Quote, on a personal note, a friend's doctor has prescribed for her a drug called Viscan that is connected with the hallucinogenic psilocybin mushrooms. Its main use is to treat hypertension. One of my former co-workers, Dr. Franz Troxler, who had participated with me in the synthesis of psilocybin, helped develop this drug while involved in a subsequent project aimed at synthesizing B-receptor inhibitors. These medicaments, sometimes called beta blockers, are used to regulate cardiac function. Dr. Troxler found that 4-hydroxyindole, which is the main component of psilocybin, was the most appropriate starting material for a new beta receptor inhibitor, and now that is marketed as Viscan. Without the research on the hallucinogenic mushrooms, where 4-hydroxyindole was discovered, Viscan and other beta blockers would never have originated. End of quote. The message I want to leave you with is that these plants, these fungi, contain wondrous molecules. They have long helped and cured our indigenous colleagues, and some of them, and hopefully ethically, are being brought to market. But it's also important to recognize that they may have very different uses than the hallucinogenic or entheogenic ceremonies for which our indigenous colleagues are employing them. Viscan, beta blockers, is just one example of the utility of these compounds for the global community. And I'm here to tell you there are more entheogenic, there are more hallucinogenic substances out there in nature, in the rainforest, in the prairie, in the boreal forest. 
but if we're going to have access to them, we have to protect those ecosystems and we have to empower and help the local communities to protect those ecosystems and the cultures themselves. <laughs>